They just don't make things like they used to. Or do they? No, they don't. And it's on purpose. And that's what this video is about. Join me today as we discuss how your grandparents have managed to have the same set of appliances since the late 1950s, yet that washing machine that you just paid $1,700 for like a year and a half ago needs to be replaced. And when corporations discovered the profit wasn't in innovation, it was in expiration. I'm King Trout. And when I see a YouTube thumbnail where someone has a fake expression of shock on their face, I become physically angry. Today we're diving into the great corporate scam known as planned obsolescence. Long before iPhones started slowing down mysteriously after updates, there was something known as the Phoebus Cartel. This was a secret meeting of the world's largest light bulb manufacturers that took place in 1924. GE, Osram, Philips, the Illuminati, of illumination. Sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll write a joke into a script and I go, hey, that's kind of silly. And then I say it out loud and I go, ugh, not happy with that one. This is one of those cases. Anywho, the reason they got together is because they had all noticed something horrifying. Their light bulbs were lasting far too long. Some of these early bulbs could burn up to 2,500 hours or longer, which depending on your usage, means you could have a light bulb that lasted literally 10 years. Hell, there's a light bulb in California that has been burning since 1901, which means at the time of recording of this video, somebody turned that light bulb on eight years before the current oldest person on the planet was born. So these companies all got together and decided, we have to make them worse. They formed a cartel and agreed to cap the lifespan of bulbs at a thousand hours. No. This wasn't necessarily an easy thing to do. They had to put a lot of research into how to shorten the lives of these bulbs. They worked towards it. What these companies' engineers eventually determined was the only way to make a bulb last shorter was to increase the wattage the bulb used and thin the filament. Which, I don't know if you're putting two and two together for any of my uh, electrically inclined friends out there. It makes the bulbs brighter. This cartel actually had a lab in Switzerland, neutral cowards, where they would send light bulbs of their competitors to to ensure that they only burn a thousand hours or less. They burn too long, cartel slaps you with a fine. Boop. I will pause here to uh, bring up a counter argument. Some argue that uh, the reason that this cartel got together was not to shorten the lifespan of the bulbs, that was just an unfortunate coincidence of their intention of making brighter light bulbs. And that's actually what uh, GE claimed in court in 1949 when they were sued for violating antitrust laws. You decide. Did these corporations join together and form a cartel in order to make shorter lasting light bulbs to increase their company profits? Or did they all get together to make the world a brighter place? Up for you to decide. Not to sway your opinion, but this was a point in time when human beings were only used to light provided at night via candle or oil or gas lamps. And it's actually much healthier for us to experience dimmer levels of night at light. Dimmer levels of light at night. And I hate bright lights. The only time I use them is when I'm blinded recording these videos. You're welcome. Oh, this dry out my eyes. Either way, innovation when it came to the lifespan of a light bulb wasn't rewarded, it was disciplined. And thus, planned obsolescence as a concept was born. The enemy of profit is longevity. Fast forward to the 1930s. The Great Depression hits, people stop buying, factories shut down, and warehouses fill up with stock. Enter the man who coined the term planned obsolescence, Bernard London. London was a real estate tycoon who wrote an essay called Ending the Depression Through Planned Obsolescence. Much like the villain of another video of mine, Edward Bernays, both had the common goal of manipulating the American populace for profit. Also, both were immigrants to America from Europe. You can find this out by checking the early life section of their Wikipedia pages. Mm, sorry, I thought I heard a dog whistle. In this essay, London proposed the idea that products be forced to expire after a certain period of time. All products. London literally proposed the idea that the government assign lifespans to goods, after which they would be confiscated and destroyed. 
Imagine there's a knock at your door, and it's the feds who have arrived to destroy your coffee table. What a f***ing stupid idea. Now, obviously, this didn't pass into law because, obviously, but the mindset stuck in a way. If things last forever, people won't buy new things. But if you design things to break, those corporate profits keep on rolling in. Fast forward again a little bit to the 1950s. Fresh out of the war, America is on top. Industry's booming and suburbs are popping up left and right like mushroom clouds on Japan in August 45. At this point in time, pretty much every American family owned a car. Which was a problem, because if you own a car and it works, why are you going to buy a second car? Why would you need two cars? Your wife's not going anywhere, it's the 1950s. She better not be going anywhere. She better be in the kitchen, loaded up on pills, cooking dinner. <coughs> Enter Harley Earl at General Motors. He realized you could sell cars not by improving upon them necessarily, but by making last year's model look lame and gay. Chrome fins, pastel paint, so-called jet age curves. Every year, a new look, a new status symbol. They called this dynamic obsolescence. Ooh. Oh, quick aside here, as much as I just shit on that guy and the creation of dynamic obsolescence, it did pretty much directly lead to the creation of my dream car. 1957 Chevy Bel Air. Convertible in seafoam green. It's my favorite color, baby. Just, oh, cruising. 45 miles an hour on the freeway, everybody's honking at me, speeding by, they don't give a shit. Blaring Cubano music, just cruising. But yeah, no, we hate that guy, he sucks. Er. GM executives openly said that they wanted their customers to feel ashamed of their old cars. The idea metastasized. Washing machines, radios, refrigerators, all being redesigned yearly, not for efficiency, but for fashion. You know, think about appliances over the course of most of your lives. 20 years ago, everybody had white appliances. And then it became fashionable to have black ones. And then there was like a one-year period where people were getting red appliances. And then it was stainless steel, and now it's black stainless. Who cares? As long as it's a gas stove and not an electric stove, I don't give a shit what color it is. But there have been too many asides in this video for me to rant about gas versus electric stoves. Consumerism became patriotic. Throwing things away was no longer wasteful. It's not the depression anymore, you gross loser. Get with the times. America entered what Life magazine proudly called the throwaway society. Consume. By the 1980s, manufacturing had learned to make things much cheaper and much worse. Plastic replaced metal. Glue replaced screws. And why employ hundreds or thousands of your fellow countrymen to build these products when you can outsource the manufacturing to a third world country? Gotta hate boomers. Then came the tech boom, and the kings of digital decay took the throne. Companies like Apple, Samsung, and Dell mastered what is called software obsolescence. You no longer physically have to break the product. Just hit yes on that software update, and the company that you purchased the product from will break it for you. Remember a couple years ago when Apple got caught throttling old iPhones with software updates? And their defense was like, oh, no, 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 that's a, that's a feature. It's actually to protect battery life. Sure. Another problem with modern devices? Them puppies are sealed up like Fort Knox, and you ain't allowed to fix them neither. Batteries are glued into place. Screws are proprietary. Repair manuals are sealed up behind NDAs. Right to repair laws? Well, every time they come up, corporations lobby them into oblivion. Because if you can fix your phone, you won't need to buy another one. And that's un-American, dammit. Also, this doesn't just apply to physical hardware. It applies to nearly every facet of your life at this point. This so-called software as a service ensures you'll never own anything again. And you'll like it. Live in the pod, eat the bugs. Adobe killed Photoshop licenses, so now you have to pay rent for those pixels. And trust me, it's not f***ing cheap. Tesla locks certain features behind paywalls. Smart fridges are basically lease agreements with ice cubes. And also, that Wendigoon tweet where his uh, printer stopped working because the card on file expired. The future isn't just disposable, it's temporary and literally tangibly does not exist. You don't own products, you borrow functionality. 
Corporations realize they can't sell to you indefinitely, but they can sell you updates till the day you die, buddy. And all this so-called progress leaves behind a mountain of corpses. Mostly electronic, but also some literal corpses of, of children in third world countries. The UN estimates we dump 50 million tons of e-waste each year. That's 5,000 Eiffel Towers full of lead, mercury, and microchips either being seeped into our soil or burned in a giant open pit somewhere else in the world. And the hypocrisy? Well, it's absolutely delicious. These corporate supply chains rely on child labor mining cobalt, and then they'll turn around and show you a commercial about what they're doing for sustainability. They'll tell you we all need to reduce our carbon footprint while flying private jets across the world to climate summits. Also, how they lie to us about recycling or energy usage. Topics which I've made entire videos on. Planned obsolescence isn't just a scam. It's incredibly profitable ecological and psychological destruction. Planned obsolescence works because it trains you. For some people, it trains them because they gotta have the hot new thing. Gotta be, gotta be top of the line, brand new, looking good. And for other people, like me, it trains you because all of your sh** is constantly f***ing breaking, so why would you buy nice sh**? Because it's gonna f***ing break anyway. Except for my 23-year-old Ford Ranger pickup truck. She'd never betray me. Girl, my Corporate marketing has turned consumerism into a sort of behavioral addiction. And even if you're not the category of constantly wanting the new whatever group of people and you're in the camp that I'm in, you have to admit, you buy a new pair of shoes or something, and one of your friends compliments them, you feel good, a little bump of dopamine. That's what they're after. Yeah, there, there is a reason people can become addicted to shopping. What can we do to counter this? I don't know, fix things, refurbish things, accept hand-me-downs. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. I had the same cell phone for seven years. People would constantly rag on me because I had an old phone. It's like, it works. Why, why would I care? That puppy... That puppy was there through some hard times. It's been in the ocean, it was in a lake, it was in two separate hot tubs. The only reason that I got a new phone is because it, I, I dropped it off of a parking garage while taking a picture and it shattered into like a million pieces. What were we talking about? Oh yeah. Planned obsolescence is the perfect crime because you're paying for your own victimhood. Every product is a subscription guaranteeing your future disappointment. But you can break the cycle. Repair what you can and reuse what still works. One way I like to think about it is, my grandfather owns a motorcycle that is 50 years old and runs like it's brand new because he's taken care of it for those 50 years. Is that cooler than a motorcycle fresh on the lot? I think so. And if you disagree, you're wrong, objectively. You're categorically wrong. It's very cool that he has maintained that to near new since he bought it 50 years ago. It's not an opinion, that's a fact. But anyway, in the modern age, durability is rebellion. Because if everything you owned lasted forever, those greedy corporations would have to work extra hard to keep you under their thumb, wouldn't they? As always, I've been King Shout. I'll see you when I see you. Love you, bye.